and with no further ado, Miss Dawn from Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to my seminar. Firstly, thank you for choosing my seminar because I know there's some fantastic speakers and seminars um, out at the show today. So um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview on how to spot poor mental health in yourself and in others. We've only got 30 minutes, so it is going to be quite a quick overview. So first of all, we're going to be looking for common stress factors for adults. So a bit of participation. What do you think common stress factors are that would affect poor mental health? Anyone? Work. Pardon? Work. 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 Money. Money. Kids. Kids. Marriage. Marriage. <laughs> relationships. <laughs> He's brave, isn't he? <laughs> um, so, yeah, fa you've, you've said many of the, 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 the main ones. So, family pressures, including and juggling family life and children, Trans relationships, uh, family pressures, um, peer pressures, alcohol and drugs. You know, they are a quick fix for poor mental health, but obviously the highs are very quick and the lows are very long and dark. Um, time management, trying to juggle and spin too many plates can also have effect on your mental health and well-being as well. Living arrangements, too many people in the house or loneliness can also have um, a stress factor for your mental health and social isolation. A lot of people's mental health and well-being got really affected during the pandemic because they were isolated and they had no conversations, no one to talk to, weren't allowed out. Health concerns, if you're fit and healthy and all of a sudden you can't do what you used to do, your brain might be still really active but your body's not, that has a massive impact on people's mental health and well-being. Being a victim of crime can also help. Feeling unproductive and not good enough. Um, worrying about the future, anxiety, worrying about things that might not possibly happen, family sickness, elderly relatives, having to look after sick children, sick relatives, um, lack of transport, again, social isolation, you can't go anywhere, especially with the cost of living crisis, you might not be able to afford to go anywhere, and sleep deprivation, if you're not getting enough sleep, then that will impact your mental health. So these are all things that impact your mental health and well-being. And again, financial worries, which we just touched on. There is a financial crisis coming. The recession haven't even started yet. We haven't even scratched the surface. There's going to be a lot of people losing jobs, a lot of money worries. Mortgages are all blooming. Um, it's going to be a lot of worries and a lot of stress factors. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty poor time at the moment. To, to be in the UK. Um, so how can we spot mental, poor mental health in others? We've seen all the stress factors, what's gonna cause our mental illness, um, but how can we recognize, because we can't help people with mental illness until we can see how, how they're being affected. So we've got physical signs, emotional signs, and behavioral. What do you think are the physical signs that people are struggling with their mental health? Anyone? Looking not looking after themselves, so not washing their hair, not having a shave, wearing the same clothes for two, three weeks, not showering. So, yeah, that is, uh, is a good sort of physical sign. Anything else? Sickness. Sickness. Our body, when we're in poor mental health, um, it comes out in other areas. Sickness, diarrhea, headaches. Um, it can even affect our heart. And uh, it can even make our hair fall out. So um, there's lots of physical signs if, um, you know, you can have stress-related al alopecia. A friend of mine had put really, really bad stress through work. He went to the doctors because he was losing his hair, and the doctor said, you're lucky it's your hair, because if it wasn't your hair, it could have been your heart. So high blood pressure is another physical sign of poor mental health. So changes in weight. When people have poor mental health, sometimes they overeat, sometimes they undereat having lots of headaches through all the worry and the stress, stomach upsets, indigestion, feeling really lethargic and tired, having panic attacks, high blood pressure and what I just mentioned, heart disease. <coughs> These are all signs that someone you might know, might love, might have poor mental health, but they're not telling you. So we can't help them until we can see. 
Then we've got emotional signs. What do you think the emotional signs could be? Anyone? Got all shy on me? <coughs> Pardon? I can't. Mood swings. Yeah, definitely mood swings. Um, mood swings, maybe being tearful. Yeah. Difficulty retaining new information. So again, if they've got poor mental health and they're in a job role that they need to meet deadlines and, and retain information. It could in, have a long-term impact. They could lose their job if they can't retain information. Um, feeling depressed. Now, we can all have bad days. We can all have off days. But if your mood is low for two weeks or longer, you need to go and see a doctor because it could be clinical depression. So you have to be two weeks or longer to have clinical depression. But there's no shame. There's a lot of stigma about and We don't talk about our mental health because of stigma. We need to drop the stigma, we need to start talking about it, and people need to be able to go out and say, I'm not feeling okay today. But because of stigma and because of we're, we're scared of being judged, we, we don't open up and we don't tell our feelings. Feeling anxious is also another emotional sign, irritable, tearful, emotional, and mood swings as well. These are all signs that somebody that you love, maybe family or friends or work colleagues, I've got poor mental health. Then we've got our behavioural signs. Anybody know how people would behave with poor mental health? Angry, Angry is one emotional, yeah? Forgetful. Forgetful. Irritable. Irritable, yes. Withdrawing. Withdrawing, social withdrawing. So if you're asking your friends to go out for coffee and they keep turning you down, that could be a sign that they have poor mental health. Yeah? So difficulty sleeping. So if they're saying to you, I can't sleep because their brain is so active that they're not being able to sleep. Um, changes in their eating pattern, either eating too much, eating too little. Some of us stop eating to try and control our feelings or some of us binge eat because it makes us feel better. So under eating, over eating, becoming withdrawn, avoiding social gatherings. If you haven't seen your friends, for quite a while, go and check up on them. They could have poor mental health. If they're not going to regular bingo or <coughs> regular yoga classes or something that they used to do, check up on them. Please check up on them because you don't know they could be struggling. Drinking more alcohol, taking or smoking drugs and becoming aggressive. These are all signs that someone may have poor mental health. Um, don't judge too quickly. You know, allow them to talk about it. Um, so these are how we spot signs of poor mental health. You might see some of these signs in yourself. You might see some of these signs in your children, in your loved ones, in your friends. But we can't deal with it until we know what we're looking for. So how to spot it in others. We've said a lot of it. Just a quick recap now. So social withdrawal, being um, emotionally distant, struggling to concentrate hard to engage in conversations. You might just get yes, no answers. Um, noticeably quieter than, than normal. Or if they're hyper, they might be over talkative. That might be them trying to cover up. Usually tired and lethargic. E exaggerated emotional reactions. Um, so they could be ecstatic or you could tell someone they've just won a million pounds on the lottery and there's no emotion at all. So these are all signs of poor mo mental health. Changes in appetite, we've mentioned. Changes in their alcohol or their caffeine consumption. And they might start missing deadlines. Um, their confidence might drop. And they might get irritable with family members and friends. So these are all signs that somebody is in poor mental health. Um, just putting my stopwatch on a minute. Making sure we're still good for time. Okay, so how can you improve? What can we do to improve our own mental health and mental health in others? Anybody? Exercise. Control it. Control it? How can we control it? Food? So control Small what amount. we eat? Small amount. Yeah? Okay. Like, um, moderation. Everything in moderation. That's smoking, that's drinking, that's eating. You think it's um, nice. I know, I love, I love drink, chocolate. Drink chocolate. 
It's, it's all too nice, isn't it? <laughs> so it's everything in moderation. So that includes eating, drinking, sleeping, exercise. People with poor mental health will actually over-exercise as well because they want to go through that pain barrier, you know? So everything in moderation. So get yourself organised as well because when your head is like spaghetti junction because there's too much going on, it impacts your mental health. It impacts your state of mind. So if you can put a nice filing system in this, in this head and, you know, untangle the spaghetti junction, then you're going to be in good mental health. Having a clean house. Lots of people with poor mental health become hoarders. They have messy houses. You see the programs on the TV. They go in and they clean their houses and then their mental health improves. So it's just having some, an organised mind and an organised environment as well. Planning your health care, making sure you're healthy. You know, don't be scared to go and visit the doctors, that's if you can get an appointment these days, but um, managing your finances as well. Some people are overwhelmed. I quite often do an audit on my finances, there's so many direct debits going out. Do you need all those direct debits going out? Are people taking money... And, and you're not known about it, or it can, becomes out of control. You know, Sky just wants £6 due, and Disney wants £4 due, and your mobile phone and everything. Before you know it, it's completely overwhelming. So you don't need to pay out everything that you're probably paying out. So do a nice little audit on your finances, and then you have more money, and then you have more, ment more positive mental health. Good work habits. You know, lots of us are rushing round trying to get to work. How about getting to work half an hour earlier and going for a walk around the block? You know, my, my office is in Cardiff Bay. I feel so good when I get there early and I have a chance to walk around the waterfront and then back in the office. That sets me up for the day and I'm in positive mental health just because I've had some fresh air and I've seen some water. So those little things can help improve your mental health just by getting organised and just by putting little daily routines. If you've got a dog, try and walk the dog before you start your day. It's just putting those little routines into play that will help improve your mental health. Connect with your children. So many of us are so busy these days. Our children are spend so much time on Xboxes and computers, and we don't spend time doing the things that the, probably the children, all they want is your time. They don't want your money, they want your time. Um, and we're all too busy running around with life. Yes, we have to earn money, we have to pay bills, but our children just want us. They don't care how much we've got on our bank accounts, they just want us. So what can we do to spend more time and be present with our children? How often do we sit down and read books with them? How often do we have conversations with them? These little things will improve our children's mental health because mental health and well-being is affected from childhood and if you haven't got it right when you're children then you're not going to get it right when you're adults so we need to protect them by giving them um, the right environment but before we protect our children we've got to protect ourselves when we're on an airplane they always say you put your oxygen mask on first you know we look after ourselves and if we're in a good state of well-being then we can look after our family. So prioritize, prioritize your well-being. You know, take yourself out. Go and have a nice bubble bath. Lock yourself away from everybody. Make sure that your batteries are fully charged. And maybe get a hobby. You know, too much of us are just work, eat, sleep, repeat. Work, eat, sleep, repeat. That's not good for mental health. Maybe throw a few hobbies in there as well. And sleep. Sleep deprivation is known to lower the state of your well-being. We all need a minimum of seven hours a day. So make sure we're getting it, make sure our children are getting it. So plenty of sleep. And if you're finding it hard to sleep, there's loads of apps that will help you sleep. I use one called New Calm. All it is is the rainforest. And I plug it into my ears at night and I fall asleep listening to the rainforest pitter-patter and I'm asleep within 10 minutes. So it's just finding those tools that can help you stay in good well-being. And the last one is healthy eating. We've all men already mentioned the sugar is delicious. Um, 
but make sure I, I was advised to eat a rainbow. It's great having the chocolate and the crisps and all the nice things, but let's put all the rainbow on our plate as well. 70% colour. If, we, if your plate is full of bland white stuff, then it's going to lower your mental well-being. If your plate is looking colourful, then you, that's brain food. It's going to lift your mood and your well-being as well. So what adjustments can we make to improve our well-being? We can practice self-care. Now, when I say self-care, obviously there's healthy eating, there's exercise, but there's also things like meditation and yoga and walking and even taking time out. There's art therapy, animal therapies, getting a dog, doing some colouring, playing with Lego, you know? My father is 74 and he loves Lego. So... What are you going to do to practice your own self-care? What are you going to do for you? Have a balanced diet. I've already mentioned about eating a rainbow. Um, and I've also mentioned about getting your seven hours sleep. Set yourself boundaries and learn to say no. A lot of us have poor mental health because we can't say no. It's a lot easier to say yes than it is to say no especially when it comes to our family and our friends. So set yourself boundaries and learn to say no. It's a lot harder than saying yes. But your, your mental health will thank, thank you for it. And again, regular walks. I mentioned I walk around Cardiff Bay in the mornings. How often do you take 10 minutes just to walk around the block and just to get that fresh air into your lungs and make yourself feel better? Stay connected with others. Social withdrawal is poor is not good for mental health and yes it's an effort to go out and to have a coffee with friends for those friends you might be the only person they see all week you know my parents i'm like yes it's a chore but they're, they're sitting at home they're 74 and me visiting them makes their day it's a chore for me because i'm very busy but i make sure that i do it because it makes their day and that 10 minute conversation means the world to them Again, mindfulness, empty your mind, get rid of that spaghetti junction and don't be scared to go and talk to a doctor, to a GP, um, there's lots of books in the library, um, so make sure that you look after yourself before you look after others. So what can we do, once we looked after ourselves, what can we do to help others with their mental health? We can create a supportive environment in our home and in our workplace. If you're here for the workplace, get mental health first aiders in, in the workplace. You know, make sure that your family are able to talk openly and frankly without any stigma or shame. Have the confidence to start well-being conversations with other people. You know, use open conversations because we know if we say to someone, are you okay, they're going to go, I'm fine. We all know I'm fine means I'm not okay. So start with an I question. I've noticed lately or I'm concerned. Then they can't say yes or no. So if you're thinking of starting conversations, start with I rather than are you okay? Talk about resources. There's lots of resources around. There's lots of resources out in the exhibition hall today. Take the resources and educate yourself. Also, there's a, there's a brilliant website that I use called Dawis.com. Every mental health organisation is on that website. And you've got the Samaritans and you've got Mind Cymru. Um, and make sure we're all empathetic. Like I say, a lot of people won't talk because of stigma. But if we show empathy, then they're more likely to open up to us. Educate yourself. Have a, an understanding of mental illness. Because if we don't understand, if I had a child with bipolar disorder... How am I going to help if I don't understand what bipolar disorder is? So I need to educate myself in that particular area so I can help my child and understand what resources are available and where. Okay, so well-being conversations, I've noticed that. So try and start with the word I. Try and talk to people when you know you're not going to be interrupted when the phone's not going to ring and the emails are not going to ping. You know, make sure <coughs> we can be more aware of others and their feelings. So actively look for the symptoms and the signs that I've been mentioning today. 
Think about the time and think about the environment. Are you away where you're not going to be disrupted? You don't want a conversation when everybody's going to run in the room and then it gets cut dead. Make sure that you could you know, get rid of furniture, sit by side by side. That's why counsellors don't have any tables in their rooms. If anyone's ever been to a counsellor, they always sit by side by side for that reason. Good eye contact. And don't be scared of pauses as well in the conversation because it gives you and them time to gather your thoughts. And if you're talking to someone, also repeat what they say because that shows you've actively listened to them. Okay, so... And think of a gentle example why you want to talk. And just don't go straight in with the, yeah, I think you've got poor mental health, but just gently go in. And you may have to have two or three conversations before you actually get to the root cause of why they're not feeling too good. So use a non-judgmental approach. Think of the body language eye contact, stare into their eyes, four seconds is the minimum you need to make sure you stare at somebody to make them feel valued and engaged and wanted. Um, open body language, so folding your arms would be confront, con, uh, con, con, uh, I can't even say the word now, someone help me out, oh, that's the word, yes. Um, so, you know, open body language, don't fold your arms, make sure you're on the same level as them. You don't want to be towering over them and making them feel intimidated. And be emotionally genuine and empathetic. So, we as mental health first aid, as my company <coughs> teaches mental health first aid, and we use an acronym <coughs> called ELGI. And this is how we help people approach someone with poor mental health. So, have anyone done physical first aid as in CPR? Yeah? And you can probably remember the acronym Doctors ABC, everybody knows that. Well, in mental health first aid, we use an acronym ELGI. And the A stands for approach, assist, and ask them when they want to talk and if they want to talk. The L is listen non-judgmentally. The G is give support and information. The first E is encourage appropriate professional help. GPs, therapists, doctors... <coughs> Uh, counsellors, CAMs, um, and then the last one, E, is encourage other supports, mindfulness, grounding, therapies, um, healthy eating, that sort of thing. So that is ELGI. If you remember that, hopefully you'll remember and have the confidence to approach someone with poor mental health. So the importance of mental health first aid in the family. Mental health is a taboo subject, not always immediately available if someone is distressed. You know, CAMS, if you've got a child you're trying to get into CAMS, is like a six-month waiting list. If you're trying to get into the mental health team or the crisis team or the GPs, you can't always get them there straight away. So we need to start conversations at home. We want them, our families and our friends and our work colleagues to know that they're in a safe environment as well. Mental health can, can offer support and comfort in crisis. So a mental health helpline. Now the NHS have, have got a brilliant new helpline. Do you all know of 111, the NHS helpline? Well, 111 option two is now the mental health helpline. So even if you give out that number, 111 option 2, if someone is in crisis, and obviously you've got the Samaritans as well, and other helplines out there. Uh, mental health problems are not as frightening as people think. There's lots of solutions out there to help people go from poor mental health to positive mental health. We just need to know where to signpost people. Um, when a person has a mental health problem, that they need... And what they need is someone who can listen calmly to their feelings and thoughts and give simple information. And that's what we can do. Okay, we're just about out of time. So just want to focus on neurodiverse um, adults um, and <coughs> make sure that we have open communication. Make sure that we can have the ability to seek professional help. Provide a support network as well with other neurodiverse adults provide structure because neurodiverse adults and children if they don't have structure that can affect their mental health 
and be patient as well. Um, patience and throughout the whole process. Ways of keeping the conversation going, listen without interruption, use open-ended questions, summarise what has been said, use verbal prompts and phrases, silence can be encouraging, it gives the person a chance to open up, beware of giving advice that we're not qualified to do and beware of the term I'm fine. Um, I'm just going to reiterate the importance of a well-balanced diet and there's your help and resources for some other useful information. So that was a, a whistle-stop tour. Um, I'm